It should be, you should have continuous effects. Otherwise, you're assuming that, when you think about this in terms of sales and advertising, I remember, so this tells us, I remember the advertising today, I remember the advertising yesterday, and I remember the advertising 12 days ago. But not 11 days ago, not 10 days ago, and 9 days ago. So I don't know much about the orange growing process, and 12 periods, if this is months, is a year ago. Uh, I don't know how, 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 how logical this sounds. The other thing is something that we haven't really talked about is um, called multicollinearity. Multicollinearity occurs when your independent variables are highly correlated. What does multicollinearity cause? It causes your t-statistics to get smaller. So this is more a sign of multicollinearity than anything else. So what is multicollinearity? Multicollinearity occurs when your x's are highly correlated. It means they're picking up kind of the same thing. And <clears throat> we're probably saying that a lot of these effects are pretty close to each other. So for example, if, if these effects are diminishing, then they're probably highly correlated with each other. And that could be the cause of these insignificant coefficients. So just remember that term multicollinearity, because it's an important term. All right, so a single free freezing day is estimated to, to uh, increase price by 49% in the month in which it occurs. Uh, one month after, uh, it increases by uh, price by 17%. But after that, it really doesn't have uh, much of an effect. All right. How do we show these? How do we visualize these results? With that. What we're going to do is not graph the regression would graph these coefficients. And this is how, essentially how it's going to look. Notice those first immediate effect, and then the one period lag, and then after that the effects become statistically uh, insignificant. So this is a picture of that. So the blue are the lag coefficients, and the gray is the 95% confidence interval. So um, we want to see, you know, is that gray above that zero line? And we can see that past here, that first period, um, none of the results are statistically different from, uh, from zero. since freezing day. So apparently freezing days past a couple of months ago aren't going to have much of an effect on uh, the current change in prices. I also did this cumulative effect, which is kind of cool. Um, Basically, it has the cumulative effect of freezing days. So um, one freezing day has that same effect of, what was it? One freezing day has that same effect of uh, point, what is it? Point 0.5 or whatever, uh, point 0.47, I think it was. So you can see the point four, point four seven there. It's the same as that. And then essentially we add the, sec the, the one period lag rate, which is 17%, and that r raises the total effect by that. And so on and so on. Not sure whether or not we're going to do this, mostly because um, it's really difficult to get confidence interval intervals for the cumulative effect. 
All right. All that is designed for really this picture. Make sense? The coefficients re, uh, represent the effect of the lag effects. We want to graph those coefficients and see whether or not they're significant. All right, so let's try it. All right, so here's the data. Um, let's T set it. So what do we got? Looks like we, whoops. All right, I just T set the data. It looks like we've got data from uh, 1948. To 2001, and it's monthly data. <clears throat> All right, just look at some graphs. Uh, let's see what is this. This is just that that, that graph over time. Pretty basic. And this is the price of frozen orange juice. Price index. What is the producer price index? What is that? You don't know what it is? You know what the consumer price index is? Kind of a measure of consumer prices, a measure of I heard something about inflation. inflation. Yeah, so it's a measure of inflation. Uh, producer, the producer price index is a measure of inflation for not consumer prices, but for producer prices. Because remember, we're looking at frozen concentrated orange juice at the, think of it at the wholesale, uh, wholesale level. So we need to look at uh, kind of a producer price index. And that's in the data set. But basically what we can see is that prices uh, relatively constant and then they increased um, starting in the 80s, late 70s, 80s. Yeah, that makes sense because oil embargoes, inflation, all kinds of nasty stuff was going on in there. Price of frozen orange juice. Frozen concentrated orange juice. The red line is the is the, think of it as uh, our measure of inflation. So what is this graph telling us? Possible cost. Some of the price of the some of the price increase could be inflation. Yeah. So some of this price increase is due to inflation. So if we're trying to measure the effect of freezing days on prices, then we should probably we don't want to attribute that increase in those that increase in the price to freezing days. So we don't we don't want to make that mistake. So one of the problems we've got to worry about with time series data is just that. Whenever we look at stuff over time, we know there's inflation, and inflation is almost always going to cause prices to rise. Sometimes it causes prices to fall. Uh, in the Great Depression, it did. During the Great Recession, some prices fell. But other than those extreme periods, prices are almost always rising. We've had actually pretty constant uh, levels of inflation, uh, pretty low levels of inflation, pretty constant levels of inflation for, oh my God, 10, 15 years. Um, so it's not really much of a problem here. But we know, we know what happened here. This is, like I said, that was the uh, oil embargo. Um, when the price of everything went up. So we should probably, which is one of the reasons we want to either adjust for inflation or look at the changes, change in prices. We don't want to look at real prices. All right, so let's look at the data on freezing days. So these are the number of freezing days per month. 
coincidentally, like that spike in freezing days, it occurs right around that same time as the spike in prices, which occurred right around the same time as the increase in inflation. So we don't, we don't want to confound all these things. Perfect. But we don't want to contract. We don't want to confuse those things. We don't want to attribute to freezing days uh, price increases that would have increased simply due to inflation. Does that make sense? So, have we ever deflated anything? Do we deflate in 580? We need to. <laughs> Okay, deflating is easy. Essentially what you do is you take price, so you calculate something called real price. You don't need the dash I don't know why I do that. It's like I'm writing code. And it's just your nominal price divided by your price index. Your price index deflates, eliminates the effect of inflation on your prices. So you can look at kind of the real value of those things. So if um, if you told me you made eight bucks an hour, what would you think? Like right today? No, it's nothing. Yeah, that's it's nothing. But if you made eight bucks an hour in 1952, you're a man. Right? You're a man, exactly. You're you're Puff Daddy. You got the uh, <laughs> the Bugatti and the big fur coat and all that stuff. Um, uh, to see what it's comparable in 1952, you would do something like this. You would deflate it to some constant level so we can compare those. So in 1952, um, eight bucks an hour would be equivalent to 75 bucks an hour today, something like that. I don't know, I don't know exactly what it is. We can find that. All right. Before we do that, so here's a scatter diagram. I don't really see much correlation there. And let's just deflate prices. So we're going to do exactly what we said. We're going to construct something called the real price. And it just equals our nominal price divided by the producer price index, which is our measure of um, uh, inflation, and multiply it times 100. The way price indices work is they're, let's look at it. price indexes work is, um, remember they're always relative to some base year. So um, list date PPI. So when you deflate things, you always have to deflate, you always have to have some something relative to to a base year. So, in this case, the base year is always going to be 100. So, in this case, it looks like uh, what's the closest we get to 100? 82. Yeah. Could be that. Prices kind of went up. So, uh, and that's probably when this is. This is uh, used 1982 as a base year. 
So all these prices we've deflated relative to 1982. And we could have picked any base here. We can kind of renorm this. But if you look at if you were, if you were to look up uh, price indices, they'll always give you a base here. 82 is a common one. 94 is a common one. Uh, and so, on. so that's all we've done. So what did we do? Let's look at prices. In actuality, if we're to adjust for inflation, it looks like the price of one shoes has actually fallen, not risen. Right? The problem was that in the late 70s and early 80s, we had um, pretty much something close to like third world hyperinflation. All right? um, so it was insane. A mortgage in 1982 would have been at a at a, like a 20%, yeah, 20% mortgage. Uh, uh, it's just insane. So that's the effect of inflation. The prices of everything went up. But in real dollars, it looks like the price of orange juice uh, was actually falling. All right. And this is, again, something we always have to deal with in, uh, with time series data, just inflation. Inflation tends to get in the way. But we can adjust for it. All right, so now here's real prices and freezing days. So we're a little bit more comfortable with this um, comparison because we know we've eliminated the effects of inflation. Uh, clearly, inflation is going to affect um, freezing days. So do we see a correlation where we see spikes in freezing days? Do we see prices go up? Well, kind of. You can see prices going down here. Here's a big spike in the number of freezing days, and then prices go up. Uh, prices going down here, another spike. So it looks like there may be some correlation. I mean, just visually. Again, this is non-scientific, but just visually we're seeing um, there might be a correlation. Yeah, the scatter doesn't look a whole lot better. Let's do a simple regression. Yeah, that doesn't help either. So we got freezing days is positive, which it should have a positive effect on price, but it's statistically insignificant. But remember, this is just a simple model. So we know we have a better model. We'll, we'll be able to uh, map that out a little better. Uh, we're also going to look at price changes instead of uh, just price. So we know how to calculate the price change. It's um, <clears throat> we use lag operators. price minus lag price, so this is the price change, divided by current price, right? And to get lag values, we can use the lag, lag operator L1 and multiply it times 100 to give us a percentage change. So we like the lag operator. Lag operators are cool. Change in log prices. So the, the lag operator works uh, in either case. All right. Uh, your problem is that I don't think you have to do uh, any change in price. So you're just using regular prices. <clears throat> in this example, it just works better. Uh, okay, so if we look at percentage change in prices, then we get a positive coefficient. Is it significant? Yeah, not significant. All right, we want to construct a distributed lag model.
Remember what we did. We ran 20, I think, regressions, and then we compared those information criteria. Now, the information criteria is is actually uh, generated every time we run a regression. We just have to ask for it. And the command for information criteria is is e stat I C for information criteria. And this will give us both the Akaki and the Bayesian information criteria. You just have to do that for 20 different regressions. But state is set up to do this up, do this for us. So what we can do is this. We can save it. Estimate store, and I'm going to call this model zero because there's no lags. All right? Zero lags. So the command is estimate store, and then zero is what you're giving a name to the stored value. Then I'm going to run start running lags. Remember, there's, it's really guess and check time. Pretty much. Let me do this. So this has zero lags, and we know that because we said it has zero lags. Now I'm going to add oops, some lags to it. And I'm going to use my um, lag operator. So my, my lag operator is L1 dot freezing days. So this is going to construct a lag value. So instead of having, instead of me generating a new variable, uh, the L1 will generate it for me in the regression itself without having to, to show up here. And there it is there. Current effect of freezing days, and then the effect of freezing days from one, uh, these are months, from one month ago. This is also going to have a information criteria that we're going, to want, we're going to want to say. Then we can do this for two period lags. So do that, copy, V, change the one to a two. Oops, what did I do? Again, we need some way of telling us when to stop. Enough of the lags. Um, the, and the information criteria is going to get that. So we can do this with, we can keep doing this until uh, for all 20 periods. But state is set up to do lags uh, for multiple periods without having to add uh, lag 1, lag 2, lag 3, lag 4. So even within the lag operator commands, there's a shortcut. And the shortcut is, Change price, change in price. We're using L with the parentheses, those are the, the round parentheses. And then we want lags from zero to two periods. 
then we'll change that from zero to three periods, then zero to four periods, and zero to five periods, and so on. And it's easier to do it that way, as opposed to adding the variable. So it's less typing, it's less error. We're going to store, OK, so let's do that. So here's the one period lag. So doing the estimate stores almost like outranking your results in a way. Exactly, except it's internal. Yeah. And we're just going to do this. And again, this is the nice thing about this command is that you copy and paste it, change it to 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, uh, and so on. And as you'll see here, I'm just going to do this. I think I did it 20 times. Boom, I'm done. Now let's look at this last one. Remember that every time we run a lab, our sample size is going to get smaller. So let's go. To, let's look at the last two, I should say. Uh, notice our. Let's do this. We've got 642 observations. When we had a how many period? 18 period lag. That only gives us 624 observations. When we have a 19 period lag. It's going to give us one fewer, so 623 uh, uh, observations. When we had a 20 period lag, it's going to subtract another observation, so there's only 622 periods uh, used in the regression. We have to use the sample size, the same sample size for all of our models when calculating our information criteria. So the information criteria have to have models used of the same sample size. That doesn't mean we have to go back and rechange all those regressions, because that would be a pain. Stata figured this out. So it'll go back and calculate all your information criteria using whatever sample size you tell it to. We're going to tell it to use the smallest sample size, which is the sample size with the most lags, which is 622. So here's the command. Uh, we did estimate store zero lags, one lag, two lag, three lag, all the way to 20 lags. So you've got to tell it which models to include in your table. So it's going to create a table with all of the information criteria from all of the models that you specify. So your command is estimate stats, and then tell it all those models that you specify. Then the cool thing, this is the cool thing, and I still don't understand how it works, but it kind of goes back and recalculates the information criteria using the sample size you specify here. So our n, for all 20 of these models, our n is going to be the same, 622, which is really cool. Because it's a pain having to change the sample size in 20 different regressions. So what do we get? We get this nice table here. This was what was in PowerPoint. So remember, smaller is better. So let's go back. Smaller is better. Uh, we just want to see, we know that for the Akaki information criteria, it just kept getting smaller. But the Bayesian information criteria, uh, 37, and then it goes up to 38, so, and then 39, and then 32. 31 and then 32 again and then it starts going up again so the Bayesian actually starts to uh, to go up and we know the Bayesian information criteria <laughs> is a better uh, better uh, estimate of our lag size so we should go with the model right we could have kept 25 
we could have done this 30 times, and the information criteria would have kept getting smaller, which would have led us to believe well, we should just we should use 30 lines or 40 lines. Uh, sometimes these things will just continue to decrease. Uh, the information criteria will continue to get smaller. Um, that the 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 Akaki information criteria is more likely to do that than the Bayesian one. But remember, we don't have the reason we're doing this is we don't have any idea how many lags we should use. We're using this as um, a means of kind of narrowing down and, and minimizing our, our model so we don't have so many lags. There's no theory that tells you you need this many lags. Uh, since there's no theory, we have to rely on these stats. Now, personally, I hate the Akaki and information, uh, I hate the Akaki and Bayesian information criteria. I don't like using them, but it's really all we got because we've got no theory to tell us when advertising is going to die out. We've got no theory how many lags to include in any of these things. So you got to use something. You got to justify your answers. Um, it's best to, to be able to justify what you did with something called an information criteria. But I can tell you this, these information criteria are sensitive and sometimes if you just keep adding lags, they'll just keep getting smaller for both of them. It just happens that the Akaki information criteria is likely to do that more often than the Bayesian information criteria, which is why we look at both. And they have these other ones too. Yeah. Uh, you have these likely ratio tests. So, uh, but we're just going to look at the information right here. Okay. So we need some we need some uh, some help in determining our lag length. We're going to stick with. Uh, does that make sense? We don't know when to stop with these with these lags. So we're going to stick with eighteen. I think that's a lot. I think that's a lot. But it's really what the information criteria tells us. And again, we have no way of, of finding the, these true lag lengths. Because remember what we have to kind of think about what we're doing. We're trying to figure out how long in the future will a freezing day today affect prices? When we go to uh, advertising and, and sales, how long in the future will a commercial today affect our behavior? So for, for how long in the future? We've got, there, there's no theory. Um, and I've had this conversation, you, you talk to marketing people, and a lot of them come from psychology and stuff like this, and they'll still just start making it, well, it's six months or it's six weeks or whatever. And they're just making it up. I don't know. We'll get different coefficients, we'll get different, different kinds of commercials. Sometimes they 